when we uh, start up with our afternoon talk. Our first speaker is Emilika, who's going to talk about active learning beyond label feedback, which sounds great. Uh, I'm really anxious to hear about it, and take it away. Uh, thanks, Rob. So this is joint work with uh, my colleague Tara Javidi and my students Chicheng and Songbai. Oh, excellent! Look like they made it. Looks like they made it to the advisor's talk. So let's <laughs> <laughs> let's go ahead. Okay. So the problem we are going to look at is uh, classification. So you know, let me just quickly remind you. But this is a you know very basic problem of machine learning. We have vectors of features. We have discrete labels. Let's say red or black. And we want to find a prediction rule in a class. Uh, for example, here it could be the class of linear classifiers to predict y from x. Okay. So the problem is if you want to build an accurate classifier, you often need a lot of label data, right? But uh, label data is really quite hard to find, right? So uh, you know, unlabeled data is cheap, so you can download a lot of documents from the web or a lot of images from Flickr. But to get label data, you need somebody to kind of painstakingly read these documents and you know, label them as uh, you know, label them the, the topics, or you know, you need somebody to kind of go through actually look at these images and label them with the objects that they have. So what we are hoping to do in active learning is we are hoping to use interaction to get around the need for so much annotation, right? So we are hoping to save on annotation, uh, which is expensive because it requires human effort to um, by by using uh, interaction in the learning algorithm itself. Okay. So here, you know, remember this was our basic task. Given x i y i's, you find a prediction rule to predict y from x's. And for active learning, oops, sorry. Uh, and for active learning, this task is. Uh, uh, the following. So now, instead of uh, x i y i's, you have x i's, and what you could do is you could make interactive label queries to an annotator. What you're going to get is, uh, you know, so you make some uh, interactive label queries, and hopefully these label queries are much more strategic than asking for every label. And why, by using this kind of interactive label queries, your hope is to develop a prediction rule by using much fewer label queries than you would have normally needed, right? By using much fewer, or by using much, uh, much less annotation cost than you would have normally needed, OK? So why does you know why do you expect this kind of thing to help? So let me show you a very very toy example, right? So just bear with me for a little bit because this example is really very toy and there are things that are wrong with it and I'll come come to it. Okay? So let's say you get these bunch of unlabeled points, you ask for that one and you see a red. Now let's say you ask for this one, you see a black, you ask for that guy, you see a red, you ask for this one, it's a red, right? And now you can say, oh, well, you know, here's the linear classifier because this is the only line that is going to separate, you know, these four points into reds and blacks. So, you know, this is my line, right? And here, what is going on is instead of labeling all these points, what you see is that you just needed four labels, right? And you know, because you could ask these labels strategically and interactively, you managed to get away with having much fewer labels. Okay, but uh, there is in fact a catch, and the catch is incorrect responses, right? So when I, when I showed you that example, that underlying assumption that you had when you used your strategy for querying labels was that the labels that you got were all correct, right? And when the labels are you know, incorrect, so to speak, uh, that doesn't you know, quite happen, right? So you know, one uh, quite a common setting in machine learning is you know, what, is what we call agnostic learning. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more formally later. So suppose what happened was you, know, you were given unlabeled data, you could make interactive label queries, and you didn't really have any assumptions on the data distribution, right? So the data distribution doesn't have to be, you know, the, the reds and the blacks don't have to be perfectly separ uh, separated by a line. You know, it is what it is. And what you want to find is you want to find a uh, line that you know that separates most of them, right? And here you wanted to do active learning. So here, what could happen is you know maybe you followed the strategy that I showed you before, but maybe this was your correct labeling, right? So here, see what happens is that one is the best classifier, the line in with the dotted line. That's the best classifier. Okay, that that makes the you know that separates uh, you know that has the least classification error. But if you followed the strategy that I was using before, you would uh, completely miss it, right? And what you would do, I mean, even if you were given a very high label budget, what you would do is, you know, you would, 
kind of hold on to this region of the space, and you would keep making a lot of queries around here. Right, and you know, even if you had an infinite amount of label budget, you would keep making a lot of queries around here and really perfect that line. Whereas the real, the, the best line actually lies very far away. Okay, and this is really the challenge in active learning, and this is what I'm going to call statistical inconsistency. Right. So what do I mean loosely by statistical inconsistency? What I mean is even if your label budget is infinite, you are going to converge to a local minimum. Right. You're going to refine this local minimum a lot, but you're going to converge to a local minimum, and you're going to miss out the best classifier altogether. Okay, and this is kind of a challenge that arises a lot in active learning, and this is something that we have to. Uh, you know, we, we have to be careful that we don't fall into this trap. Okay. okay, and so in this talk, we are going to talk about, so that was kind of a very, you know, cartoonish overview of active learning. In this talk, we are going to talk about, you know, uh, not just getting feedback where, you know, where the, the, uh, uh, where, where the feedback that you get is labels, but uh, with a slight, uh, with slightly different kind of feedback. And this is, you know, this is the, uh, the kind of research, uh, this is the kind of agenda that, you know, we have been looking at for, uh, not, not just us, like a lot of people in the uh, community have been looking at for the last few years. And I will talk about two kinds of, uh, you know, different feedback in this particular talk, and this is you know, based on uh, uh, some of our previous papers. The first one is when we have weak and strong labelers, and this is joint work with Chi Cheng. And the second one is when we have labelers which sometimes say, I don't know, and this is joint work with Song Bai and my colleague, Tara Jabili. Okay. Okay. So let's start uh, with weak and strong labelers, and let's uh, start by taking a look at the model. Okay. Uh, so, for, okay, sorry. So, for, first, if, uh, let me uh, start out by giving. Uh, uh, so, uh, so, let me first start out by telling you a little bit about the model, and then you know we will uh, talk about weak and strong labeler. Okay. So, the model that we are going to use for this weak and strong labeler problem is what is called the uh, PAC model, or the probably approximately correct model. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but let me just do, do a cartoon overview anyway. So here. Uh, what is happening is you have a concept class C, and you have samples xi and yi that you draw from some data distribution D, right? So as a concrete example, your C could be a class of linear classifiers, right? And your goal would be to find a classifier in your class which has no error under the data distribution, right? So there are uh, uh, so so there's a couple of things to observe here. So one is that the error, I am uh, measuring the error with respect to the underlying data distribution. Uh, so in general, you would never really know, uh, you know, you, you never really know what your underlying data distribution is. You have a bunch of samples from it. But uh, so, uh, but, but this is our goal, right, is to get uh, C with low error with respect to the data distribution. So you have to, in fact, worry about, uh, you know, is the sample error representative of the uh, broader error, so you have to worry about these kinds of things. Uh, so, so that is, uh, you know, so that that is our, our goal in this uh, problem. Okay. So we will look at two versions of the PAC model that shows up quite a lot. So the first one is the realizable case where there is a perfect classifier, right? Uh, and you know, so that probably, you know, as you can guess, rarely happens in practice, but it's a, a nice and simple abstraction. Uh, the second one is when that's not the case, right? So you know, so the, you can see in this picture here, there are pluses and there are minuses, and there's a little pocket of minus uh, says inside the pluses, and uh, you know, it doesn't matter what linear classifier you have, nothing can separate all the pluses from all the minuses, right? So here, what we want to do is we want to have essentially no assumptions on the data distribution, and our goal is to find the best classifier in a class that we can. And so this leads us to, and this is called the agnostic model. So this essentially leads us to uh, agnostic active learning, so which is the formalization of our problem. We have a concept class C, and the best classifier in C has error, you know, let's just say has error new star. We are given a bunch of XIs, and we can make interactive label queries on these XIs, and our goal is to find a a classifier in C with error at most new star plus epsilon using very, you know, as few label queries as we can and when we have no assumptions on D. Okay, so this is essentially a formal statement of our problem. Okay. okay. 
Uh, so what kind of algorithms can be used in this case? Well, for the basic problem, so this is the problem when you know you are getting label uh, feedback from uh, from your annotators. In this case, there's uh, th there's a fair bit of work, and uh, essentially there are three classes of algorithms. Uh, for the agnostic problem that apply to the agnostic problem. So one is called disagreement-based active learning, and you know a lot of people in this room have worked on this problem. Uh, Blum, uh, I think, uh, uh, Begelzheimer, uh, Balkan, and Langford, uh, Haneke, Dasgupta, uh, Haneke, Mon uh, Dasgupta, Sue Monteleone, and many others. And then there is also margin-based active learning. This is due to uh, Balkan, Broder, and Zhang, and also you know Balkan and Long. And uh, more recently, you know, uh, we have shown that this is related to confidence-based uh, active learning. So, uh, and finally, there is uh, you know clustering-based active learning. This is the uh, first uh, uh, work on this was by uh, Dasgupta and Su, and then you know there's been more recent work by Erner et al. And this work, what we are going to do is we are going to base this on disagreement-based active learning. So that that would be uh, what we will look at. And let me also give you a very quick overview of disagreement-based active learning. The main idea here is that you maintain a candidate set of classifiers that contains the best classifier in C. And your unlabeled data comes by one after the other. So if an unlabeled data point comes by, and if there exist two classifiers, C1 and C2, in your set, in your candidate set, uh, that uh, that differ on its label, then X is in the disagreement region of uh, V, and then you're going to query the label of X, and you're going to update V accordingly, right? So you know, unlabeled data comes by, you maintain some set of classifiers which could be your best, and you know, as unlabeled data comes by, if there is some disagreement, then you query the label, and based on the label, you keep updating V. Okay. Uh, so what we are going to look at today is we are going to start with this framework and we are going to look at what happens if we have auxiliary information in the form of an extra oracle. Okay. So an example of this would be, uh, so let's say you want to label medical images. You have a doctor, uh, you know, you have a physician who's... Uh, uh, whose time is valuable, but who is who's going to give you the you know who's going to think about it and who's going to give you the correct answer? Or you can have uh, let's say a medical resident who is uh, you know whose time is less valuable, but the answers that you get might be sometimes wrong, right? So this is the kind of setting. And in this setting, how do you co combine uh, you know how do you combine annotations from weak and strong labelers to make good predictions? So that's essentially the question that we are asking. So going back to a model, you know, what does this mean for a model? We again have a bunch of X-I's, and instead of Y-I's, we are allowed to make interactive label queries. Uh, and these label queries could either be to the oracle, right, which is, you know, think about the oracle as the doctor, or to the weak labeler, right, oracle O or weak labeler W, or, you know, or to, or to both if you want, okay? And your goal is to find a prediction rule to predict Y from X's using few label queries to O, right? So as a simplifying assumption, we are assuming that uh, you know, queries to W are essentially free. What we'll see is that we won't need really that many queries to W. So it won't be worse than standard active learning. Uh, so we are assuming that queries to W are essentially free, but we want to use a, um, so what we want to use is as few label queries to O as possible, okay? And uh, formally, again, now we have a concept class C, where the best classifier has you know, some error uh, new star with respect to O. And again, you have a bunch of XIs uh, and interactive queries that you could make either to the Oracle O or the weak label at W. Your goal is to find a concept in C with error new star plus epsilon. Um, and here the catch is that the error is this is with respect to O while minimizing the number of label queries to O. Okay, so here what we are assuming is that the oracle is the ground truth and we are trying to approximate the oracle's labeling function using the best concept in, in the class. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the setting. Okay. okay, questions until now? Okay, excellent. So what does this uh, mean, right? So, you know, I, I gave you all this math and I gave you this formal model. You know, what, what does this mean? Uh, what, what does this mo model mean and what kind of problems can arise in this model? So the kind of problems that could arise in this model is that the weak labeler W may be biased, right? So what do I mean by this? So let's say this is O's labeling function and this is W's labeling function, right? 
So what is happening here is there is this region in the middle where W just completely gives you the wrong labels, right? And, and, and this region, you know, it's, it's not like a random coin toss. You can't ask W 100 times and get better results by averaging, you know, this is some of the things that you could do in crowdsourcing. Here you can't do them because the labels are just biased, okay? So uh, previous work, so before uh, our work, there had been some uh, work on this particular setting. Uh, there was, uh, you know, uh, Erner et al. They looked at explicit uh, making explicit assumptions on where W and O differ, and you know they assumed that W and O, o are going to differ close to the decision boundaries, and then they had some interesting results. Uh, there was another work by I think Chesa Bianchi uh, et al. where they didn't have explicit assumptions, but they just looked at you know robust regression and online uh, online learning. So online. So this was a workshop paper in NIPS 2014. And they looked at online selective classification and robust regression. In this paper, what we are going to use is we are going to look at you know, general learning strategies, so basically classified learning strategies, by combining labels from W and O without explicit, uh, explicit assumption. Okay. So can we yes. if, if uh, <laughs> just a uh, noised version of O, when you flip it, so they had the same decision boundary, then ultimately you need no oracle queries. Absolutely. But can you actually achieve that without knowing ahead of time? Uh, I mean, I guess we'll maybe get to that, but I mean, so in some cases, if, if W wasn't biased, Right. Right. right, 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 right. Then you wouldn't need O at all. Uh, that's right. So if W wasn't biased, then uh, then in, in theory you were right. You you could you know technically like keep asking W a lot of times. Boosting algorithm is as long as at each iteration you get error less than forty nine percent. Yeah. 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 You could do that. But without making that assumption, it's not clear that you could adapt to it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So here, W could be biased, and which is the this is you know the crux of the problem that we are trying to solve, which is which is what makes the problem hard. Uh, yes. Sort of following up on that, there's from Jaime Carmel a couple years ago, where uh, on estimating the accuracy of the oracle or or various oracles rather than making an assumption. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. Yes. So the the flip side of Rob's question is if W provides no information. Right. So W always says minus one. Right. Then so you can't do better than active learning. That is absolutely true, and here that that is that will come across okay. in the in our um, yeah. In our, uh, okay. So how do we learn in this model? And here is kind of the main idea, right? So we are going to learn a difference classifier H that will predict where O and W differ. And then we will age, uh, use H as a filter with standard active learning to decide if we are going to query O or if we should query W, right? So you know, first we find out where O and W differ. Then you use this uh, you know difference you know filter kind of thing as a filter with standard <coughs> active learning. Okay, so that's kind of the idea. Okay, so you know this is the algorithm. You train, you know, you query a bunch of points for both O and W, figure out if they differ, train a difference classifier, run standard disagreement based active learning. Okay, yes. So maybe I missed it, but did you, what are we guaranteed about the W? Uh, so the, we don't make any explicit assumptions about W. So I, I know you're thinking that this might take as many samples as uh, you know full active learning, but we'll, we'll come to that. This is yeah, that's definitely true. But we get around it through some tricks. So uh, we'll, we'll come to that. Okay. So this is our algorithm outline. Okay. Now, what could be the problem with this? You know, so first of all, you know, so let, let's say let's forget about labels, right? Is this even statistically consistent, right? And actually, the answer is no. And this is you know one of the key observations that we made. Okay. So why 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 not? Uh, let us look at this particular example, right? Let's say this is the actual example. Uh, you know, the, this is the oracle. Oracle labels the entire space at yellow, okay? And sorry, uh, uh, yeah, the oracle labels the entire space as yellow. Uh, if you look at W, W is going to label that corner over there as gray, okay? Now, uh, you know, in this case, if you want to find, uh, if, if in this case, if you uh, sorry. So in this case, if you uh, run this algorithm 
and if you want to find eight star, well, this is the eight star, right? So let's say we are looking at eight star uh, as linear classifiers. This is the eight star that best predicts the difference between, uh, you know, best predicts where O and W differ. This is the region where they differ. This is the region where they don't differ. So here you're going to query O. Here you're going to query W, right? What is the annotation that you're going to get? Well, if you if you do this strategy, if you query you know O and W here, and you know if, if this strategy gives you an annotation, this is the annotation you will get, right? Which is not O's annotation, okay? And so as a result, if you use this annotation to strain your final classifier, your final classifier won't really be, you know, it's not O's labeling function, right? So your final classifier be, uh, it'll, it'll be statistically inconsistent, okay? So how do you get around this? Well, uh, we can actually use something uh, simple, uh, which what we'll do is we will essentially use a cost-sensitive difference classifier, right? So our observation is that if O and W differ, and we say that they don't differ, that is kind of dangerous, right? Because that could lead to an inconsistent annotation. Whereas if they don't differ, and we say that they differ, well, that's just some extra queries to O, right? So we can afford to make those kinds of mistakes. So that is essentially our, uh, so that, that's essentially uh, our strategy. Instead of training uh, you know, a difference classifier, we'll train a cost-sensitive difference classifier where we constrain the false negative rate to be close to, zero, false negative error rate to be close to zero, okay? And, uh, and in fact, if you do this, then as you can see, you will probably be a little bit more conservative in terms of where you query O, but what will happen is you won't be inconsistent, right? So the statistical consistency will be maintained. Okay? Okay, so this is, uh, this is the solution to that problem. Okay. Anyway, so this is, this is basically what you will get. Okay, so then this is our algorithm. You you know you train the difference classifier. Now it has just false negative error rate, less than or equal to close to epsilon. Okay. Uh, now the question is uh, fine. So now you know we have this algorithm. What about its label complexity? And you know here by label complexity we'll just use the number of queries to O, right? We don't care about W very much. Okay. Um, let's see how many labels you need to train the difference classifier. In fact. Uh, as it happens, you need about d prime over epsilon labels to train the difference classifier, where d prime is the VC dimension of the difference class, and you know this is bigger than the label requirement of you know sometimes it's even bigger than the label requirement of active learning itself, right? So the question is, can you know can we do something about this? Okay. Uh, um, so for this, we uh, use so here comes in our second observation. So the second observation is, you know, so imagine you have your uh, entire input space and you have your disagreement region, right? So currently, you know, remember we had this candidate set of classifiers. We looked at where these classifiers disagree, which was the disagreement region, and that's where we would query labels, right? Everywhere else we know what the label is, okay? Now the second observation is that we don't really need our difference classifier to work outside this disagreement region, right? All we need for our, uh, our, uh, our difference classifier to do is to work well inside this disagreement region. And, uh, so, so, and so it's okay to train the classifier just restricted to this region, okay? And this is essentially what is going to help us. So basically what we need is R is the disagreement region. Then the false negative rate of the difference classifier has to be epsilon over the probability of R, or there's a probability mass of R. And so essentially the number of labels we need is O of D prime times probability mass of R over epsilon, right? And probability, this R is keep going to keep shrinking as you label, you know, as you train more and more, this R is going to keep shrinking more and more, right? And as a result, you, you, you'll be okay because, uh, you know, overall this will uh, work out okay. okay? And uh, so again, you know, R keeps shrinking. So that's, that's a kind of a side problem. R keeps changing, shrinking and it keeps changing. So what do we do? Well, you know, we have to keep retraining every so often. Okay, and this gives us the full algorithm. So we do an epoch-based algorithm. In epoch k, you know, we target excess error of uh, epsilon k, which is about one over two to the k. Uh, we start out with a confidence set vk, which has disagreement region, disagreement uh, of vk, 
And then we draw a certain number of samples from this region and query O and W, right? So don't worry too much about this particular number. Essentially, just a thing to keep in mind is this is just enough samples to get false negative rate epsilon k over that disagreement region. That's you know that's what that number means. It's uh, uh, I know it's a little complicated. Then you, tra uh, you query O and W and then train a difference classifier. And then you would run disagreement-based active learning algorithm to target the excess error, uh, to target excess error epsilon k. And then, you know, if a queries the label of x, then, you know, then, uh, yeah. I, and then basically use this, uh, you know, a will use your, uh, the, the difference classifier that you learned, then a is going to use the difference classifier as a filter, right, to de decide whether it's going to query o or whether it's going to query w. Kamarika? So formally, VK here is um, like the set of all classifiers with uh, low regret that, exactly. and that, and that have uh, the false negative rate boundary. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so again, uh, just to give you a slight, um, you know, now now this is probably the next few slides are going to be a little bit technical. So how do you measure the exact label complexity? Remember, the label complexity is uh, measured by uh, of disagreement-based active learning is measured by the disagreement coefficient, which I guess Steve came up with. And uh, so I'm going to just use kind of a simplified version of it, so it's not the best version. But uh, essentially, the idea here is uh, the disagreement coefficient. The way to think about it is it's the rate of change of uh, you know, the probability mass of the disagreement region as you shrink R, right? So R is, you know, all, uh, you know, all, all, all classifiers at a certain distance. And then, you know, as you shrink R, the disagreement region of these classifiers also shrink, right? So this is essentially the rate of change of the disagreement region. And um, so usually what happens is, uh, okay, so disagreement region. So here, uh, the total number of labels to train the difference classifier would be d prime times the disagree uh, times theta uh, of new star plus epsilon over epsilon. Okay, and for the rest of active learning, uh, we again need you know sorry this part is a little bit uh, technical. So for the rest of active learning, we need to define uh, some measure of how much the O and W differ and how well this is predictable. So what we will do is we will, uh, you know, we will make a couple of assumptions. So the first assumption is that essentially there is a classifier which has low false negative error over the disagreement region, right? So there is an age which has uh, low false negative error. And then, you know, alpha RT essentially uh, measures the rate of positives of this age, right? So here the thing to remember is that alpha RT is always going to be less than equal to the probability mass of the disagreement region. Okay. Uh, and if you, you know, and then you can again talk about the rate of change of alpha and that you can measure by sigma. So uh, imagine sigma is like a corresponding term to theta of the disagreement coefficient, but this is measuring something a little bit more complex. And so what you would get is the number of labels for active learning, what you would get is d sigma nu star squared over epsilon squared, where sigma is the rate of change of this, uh, you know, of, of this region. Whereas what you would get for disagreement-based active learning is instead of sigma, you would get theta, right? And then the thing to remember is sigma is less than or equal to theta. If sigma is much better than theta, then you can get a gain. Okay, and it, it could be equal to theta in the case that Akshay mentioned when, you know, W is completely random or W is completely biased, then it would be equal to theta. But, you know, in the cases that it's not, then you're able to get a gain. What about the other extreme? which uh, Rob was mentioning? Yeah, so we don't quite cover that other extreme. So this is, uh, I guess the point of this algorithm is to cover the bias. You're right, the other extreme we haven't looked at in this case. Okay. That, that's an interesting uh, open question. Okay. Yes? So um, if you assume that the, um, the, uh, the oracle uh -huh. makes a little bit of mistake, mm -hmm. not perfect, then that doesn't go through, right? Uh, so, um, so when you say a little bit of mistake with respect to what? Uh, because this goes through in the case when the, let's say you're looking at linear classifiers, the oracle's labeling function is not linearly separable. But what this will do is it will find the best classifier in the class. Right, well, uh, what I'm saying is that even the, the oracle may not, may or may not use a linear classifier, right? So this is right, a, yeah. But even 
treatment, whatever the oracle is using. Okay. So it's, it's, a, it's a strong oracle, but it's not perfect. Right, but then what is perfection? So, but there is a labeling, so the, uh, the like in your doctor case, right? So there is a correct labeling, but the, even the doctors may make mistakes. Right, right, right. But then, you know, you have to have some signal from that labeling, right? So if you don't have any signal from the labeling, the best you can do is approximate the oracle, who's the best approximation. So, okay, so this was uh, active learning with uh, weak and strong labelers. Uh, the next, what we are gonna do is we are gonna talk a little bit about uh, active learning with abstentions. And you know, this kind of came up in the last talk, because I think a lot of people were asking Adam, oh, are your labelers going to say 50-50 all the time? Or you know, what happens if they say, I don't know? So you know, this is kind of the answer. Uh, you know, this, this answers some of the things that you could do when the labelers say, I don't know. So, um, so what is the uh, what is the uh, so what is the setting? Well, the setting is that you know you have again you are doing active learning. Uh, sometimes when you ask uh, you know these kinds of questions to uh, labelers who are you know even sometimes labelers who are even experts, but you know mostly when you ask these questions to non-experts, what are go what's going to happen is that the labelers are going to abstain on the more difficult examples. And if you force them to give a label, then you know they're just going to give you something gibberish, uh, or you know if they have this option, then they're going to you know they're going to say I don't know. And uh, what we are going to do is we are going to look at uh, take a you know kind of take kind of a formal look at you know can we exploit these abstentions somehow to learn better? What are the conditions under which we can do this? There is a bit of empirical work, including some by Jerry, uh, on uh, on a related topic. Uh, in this uh, work, we are going to just take kind of a formal look and try to understand when we can say something over here. Okay. okay. So uh, let's let's start out with kind of a very basic and simple example. Suppose what we are looking at is uh, a concept class uh, of thresholds, and we have some instant space of zero to one. You know, this interval is the instant space, and we are looking at a concept class of thresholds. Okay, and let's say there is some underlying ground truth. So we are changing uh, models a little bit over here. We are not, you know, we are not in this agnostic model anymore. We are changing models a little bit here. So there is some underlying ground truth C star. Okay. And so what is our model? Well, basically the learner can query any x in x, okay? So again, this is a little bit different. It's not just uh, allowed to query the labels of the xi's. So this is, you know, this is what uh, a lot of learning theorists would call the membership query model. So uh, you can query any x in x. So we're just doing this as a simplifying assumption. Uh, any x in x, and it will get a bunch of responses. So the responses could be plus or minus or don't know. And they are going to be drawn from some unknown distribution, p of y given x, right? So there's some probability which depends on x, uh, whether you're going to get a plus or a minus or I don't know, right? And what we want to do is our goal is to find a concept C. So here a concept is going to be uh, a threshold, right, a C such that the gap between C and C star is at most epsilon, right? So here, you know, again, there is no data, uh, there's no underlying data distribution, really. We can make, you know, any query we want. But what we want to get is something that is geometrically close to C star with uh, uh, as few queries as we can, right? And, you know, the queries could also give you in, uh, abstention results. Okay? So let's start out by trying to understand when can abstentions happen, right? Suppose this is our p of uh, y equal to abstain given x, right? So here, notice what is happening is you have your c star, but you know the abstention rate is sort of random, right? So it has, it's not really telling you anything much about c star. It doesn't tell you anything much about what's going on. It's you know going up, going down. It's really kind of random, right? And you know this kind of abstention rate, well, you know maybe we can throw all the abstentions, but beyond that, this is not going to be super informative, okay? Here is another example of the kind of abstention rate you could get, right? So here, what is going on? This is our C star, which is the you know which is a decision boundary, and as you get closer to the decision boundary, the abstention rate sort of goes up. So which basically means that you know as you get closer to the decision boundary, your examples get more and more difficult. So uh, you know it makes sense. You know gets more and more difficult, and then the labelers just start saying don't know much more often. Okay. And uh, you know, and it doesn't really have to be symmetric or anything, but essentially, you know, the idea is that it goes up as you go closer and closer to the decision boundary. And uh, this kind of abstention rate, you know, this this might give us some information because you know, as we see them going up, we can say, oh, okay, this looks like we are getting closer. 
right? You know, they're starting to say, don't know, so these are the more difficult example. Maybe we can do something over here. Okay? Uh, one picture I had in my mind was one where the abstention rate was one uh -huh. in an interval around C star, so that then you can only achieve certain epsilon in it. Right. So, exactly. So, so then what would happen is, so what Rob is saying is, if, what if the abstention rate is 1 uh, in an interval around C star? So what would happen is you could use our algorithm to get to that interval, and then you would be stuck, essentially. Yes. And can I ask, did you bake this uh, assumption of you know, high uh, uh, abstention rate means you know, the decision boundary into the algorithm? Or is there something for it to discover? In other words, can I flip the uh, red curve and I could just have a really weird expert who abstains a lot on, on you know, extreme uh -huh, uh -huh. very low extension rate in the middle? So we need the abstention rate to, you know, we, we don't need the, uh, uh, the, we do need the abstention rate to go up or like not decrease as we go closer to the boundary. So uh, <coughs> yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. Uh, okay, so this is essentially our model, and now let's look at you know a plausible algorithm. Okay, so you know the basic algorithm that you know so so let, let's start with what happens when we don't have abstentions, right? So this is you know a very basic thing, the absolute basic algorithm, active learning algorithm ever, right? The binary search. Okay, so you start with an interval which contains C star. Let's say you even get correct responses. Okay, so now you have an interval containing C star. You know, you make a query, you get a plus. You know, now you know C star is lying on that side, right? So you divide the plausible interval by half, right? And you keep going on until you know you've gotten to epsilon. So very, very simple. Okay. Now, uh, what happens when your queries are noisy? So you know, when you uh, you know when you make a query and you may not get the correct label, it's flipped with some probability. So here again, you can query multiple times. So you'll query multiple times. You know, you will do some averaging, and you will get the ground truth label with high confidence. Okay. And you know this will also work when your noise rate is increasing because what you could do is you could adaptively decide how many queries to make, right? So you make some queries, you do, you know, so there are standard results that you could use. This one is by Bala Subramani and Ramdas. So what you could do is you could say, okay, I made these many queries. This is how many zeros and ones I saw. Uh, this is my confidence on whether this is, uh, you know, the the uh, the probability of, uh, you know, whether this label is going to be plus or minus, right? So you can say this kind of thing, you know, standard confidence, online confidence intervals, and then, you know, you, 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 can, you can still do this kind of thing, okay? Now, we are going to start out with that algorithm, and we are going to start out by making it handle abstentions, okay? So for abstention, instead of doing a binary search, what we will do is, you know, so let's say we have a potential interval. We are going to query at the quartiles of the interval, right? So we'll make three queries, and Y3 will become clear very soon, so we'll make uh, I guess one fourth, you know, median and three fourth, right? Uh, first quartile, median, and third quartile. We, we are going to make queries, and you know, we'll make a bunch of queries. And after each query, we will again, ad uh, you know, adaptively determine if we are confident in the label at any of these points, okay? Or if the abstention rate is increasing in some direction. Okay, so for example, here what might happen is you know we see maybe you know so I, I can't draw that many pluses and minuses, but you know maybe here you see five pluses and one minus and one abstention, and then you can say okay, so you know uh, after my hypothesis test, I'm pretty confident that this is going to be a plus, and so you know then you know the label and you can uh, uh, you you can uh, trunk it off the interval, right? Or what you could do is you could you know you could similarly decide that the label was minus, or you could figure out that you know based on these uh, based on the responses that you have gotten, you could figure out that the abstention rate is going up in one direction, and then you could decide okay so it looks like the abstention rate is going up in this direction so uh, C star is in that direction okay yes question. So uh, what's the noise model here for the noisy labels? Like, is it just uh, additive uh, noise, or uh, is that also going to get affected by how close? So the noise model is that uh, you have a ground truth, and your ground truth is going to be, uh, your response is the ground truth. Uh, it doesn't have to be additive. So the response is, you know, there's some p y given x, right? Which okay, so that that can depend also on how close the exactly is. exactly exactly. Okay. Yes. Question. It's related actually. So are there your the responses are 
So you can query one point multiple times. You can, yes. And it's non-persistent, yes. Uh, non-persistent ones, yes. It's non-persistent, but they're also independent. They're also independent, correct. So, uh, so you can determine if we are confident the label at any point, or if the abstention rate is increasing in some direction, right? And based on this, you can truncate, okay? And uh, so again, so you know, coming back to the question of why do we need three? Because the reason why we need three is if we want to determine the direction in which the abstention rate is increasing, if we had two, you know, then one with one we can't really figure out if the abstention rate is increasing. With two, what could happen is you know these could have the same abstention rate uh, because it went up in the middle, right? So that is why we need three. Okay. So performance guarantees. So this algorithm is in fact, you know, does not need to know any parameters of p y given x. And here is essentially the answer to your question. So this will work correctly. This will get you close to C star. So it'll be statistic. It will give you the correct answer so long as the abstention rate does not decrease as you move closer to the boundary. Right, so your abstention rate, you know, stays the same. It will get you there, and then maybe then it will get stuck. Or if your abstention rate increases, then it's good for the algorithm. It will manage to exploit this information. Uh, so long as the abstention rate does not decrease close to the boundary, this algorithm will be fine. Okay. And uh, so, what about the number of queries? So again, you know, this is the one slide where I will get a little bit technical. So you know, we have kind of a a fairly complex sort of uh, analysis which gives you the number of queries. What I'm going to do is I won't go into the details of the analysis. I will just explain with one example which our analysis covers. Okay? So the example is suppose your abstention rate looks something like this. right? So your abstention rate looks like 1 minus C0 x minus C star to the alpha. right? So what, what does this mean? So this is your C star. At C star, your abstention rate is 1. right? And uh, you know it goes down, you know, kind of like this, right? And you know the the rate at which it goes down is measured by you know uh, c zero, uh, the distance between x and c star to the alpha. Okay? And let's say your noise rate is uh, less than or equal to half minus c one times x minus c star to the beta. Okay? Uh, so again, you know the noise rate is. Uh, Sorry, your noise rate is a half at the um, at the decision boundary, and then you know it goes down. Uh, and alpha and beta are greater than or equal to one. So essentially, if you just had this, this would be you know kind of like the Sibakov noise condition. So this is a corresponding version of this for abstention. So it's a corresponding version of the Sibakov noise condition for abstentions. So in this case, uh, the number of queries to get to c minus c star less than or equal to epsilon. So to get to distance epsilon would be uh, you know, by, within log factors O of epsilon to the minus alpha. Okay? And if you just use labels, and you know, if you just use labels, and if you throw out the abstentions, what you would get is O of epsilon to the minus alpha minus twice beta. Right? Because you know, essentially you're throwing out the abstention. You was, you know, uh, for each label, you need to get, you know, essentially when you're really close, for each label, you need like 1 over epsilon to the alpha abstentions. So you know, you're paying the abstentions, and you're paying to get like the, you know, to average the labels, and you, you need a lot of queries. Right? Whereas here, what our method is doing is that it's essentially using the signals from abstention. And as a result, it's doing much better. And you know we have so our result in its full generality talks about you know what happens when it uses both labels and abstentions and so on and so forth. So in full generality, it's quite complex. But I want to just give you this example to illustrate what it is that it's doing. Okay. okay so uh, finally, here's a summary. Uh, what we learn is that abstentions might help if the rate of abstentions increase close to the decision boundary, and you know, um, so the, you know, so we can we can uh, do something when this case holds, and we can you know I, I told you about alg uh, algorithms for thresholds, but this also extends to uh, smooth boundary fragments, you know, kind of like the Castro and Novak results. Uh, we can get it to extend to smooth boundary fragments, and you know we've been looking at the PAC model, so this is kind of work in progress. Okay. So conclusion, 
you know, I started out by talking about active learning with more complex feedback than labels. So essentially, you do, you know, you can get more complex feedback to help active learning, but you know, not always. You know, as generally is the case, it will help you under certain favorable conditions. However, we need to. Uh, use fairly sophisticated algorithms. So we need to really think about when the, uh, in the interaction is helping us or not, and we need to use uh, algorithms that are a bit more sophisticated than just using simple label feedback. Okay? And with that, I'll take your questions. Like I'm thinking of a lot of real applications where maybe you have some initial sort of classifier that maybe was developed by some rules of thumb or something else like that. And now you're saying, or maybe it's just been developed for general purpose, but you want to kind of uh, adapt it to you know, specific case of a, an individual user or oracle. Yeah. So in that, have you thought, I mean, I guess there's no reason why that couldn't play the role of the weak labeler. Uh, and then you could uh, personalize the classifier or customize it to a particular oracle that way. Yes, absolutely. So you're absolutely right. Uh, so, so, so one of the things I didn't mention is so the problem we are talking about is the problem of uh, essentially domain adaptation, right? So where the data distribution could change a little and the labeling function could change a little. So what we are dealing with is we are dealing with domain adaptation when the when the labeling function changes. So we haven't talked about what happens when the data distribution changes. So so long as, so my point is so long as in your new application, the underlying distribution of Xs does not change, this solution will very easily go through. We would need something a little bit more if the underlying distribution of Xs change. Can you help me build intuition on what happens in a slightly higher dimensional space like in 2D? Well, how does your the quantile interval change in, in 2D? Right. So in 2D, what we are looking at are uh, essentially smooth boundary fragments. So there, what we would do is we would do multiple 1D problems. So we just break it down into a bunch of 1D problems, and then we would solve them. I see. So it's a non-parametric setting, so we break it down into multiple 1D. And I see. So, so that actually poses some interesting constraints on what the uh, uncertainty regions can be. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, yes, absolutely. Yes. Was the epsilon to the minus alpha result, uh, is that optimal? Ah, so excellent question. So for 1D, I believe we have a lower bound. That lower bound doesn't quite extend to the d-dimensional case, the boundary Is that yeah? Okay, let's thank Kimberly again.